a week of our part three in our series pain management uh, flies under the truth of all addiction, all addiction, soft addiction, hard addiction, uh, real addiction as AA calls it, uh, culturally relevant addiction. Um, all addiction is pain management. How do we manage pain in our lives? Where does our management, maybe at times our mismanagement of pain in our lives take us? And we're starting to use terms, you know, in a sense, it's kind of like we've, we've started this glossary of what we mean by certain terms. And I'm not going to take time to explain all of them, but they are all informed by the previous messages. And so you can go on our uh, City Life uh, Church site, you can go on our City Life uh, YouTube uh, channel, and, and you can access, uh, you can go on iTunes uh, and access those previous talks so that if some term or something needs to be informed, it will be there. The, the one thing I want to mention this morning is as we look at, you know, this idea of all addiction is pain management, one of the things that's occurred to us, we have our groups where we hope that there is more uh, process, personal process of some of these principles of recovery for all of us. But we've also looked at it and said, you know, maybe guys in particular need a place where they can interact around some of these principles and some of these steps and how they can go deeper in our lives. And so beginning this Wednesday, I believe uh, it's at the Rivers, uh, and Rivers has now moved to uh, Clearbrook Road, just as you take the on-ramp onto the highway, at 7 o'clock. Uh, and it's open invitation. Um, you know, if you're a guy, you go, I want to process some of this stuff more in this context, then we'd love to have you come and join us there. One of the defining moments of my life took place on Highway 6, if you can picture this, as you go west from Nelson, BC. I was a student at UVic at the time, and I had been on a summer work term in Nelson, and I'd been offered a second work term in Williams Lake. And I was, uh, which I had accepted. And so on that fateful day at the end of summer, I loaded everything that I had uh, into my, and you can see up here, my, my trusty mid-70s Honda Civic. And as you can see, you know, I couldn't have had much because I fit it all into that little tin can. And I started making my way out of, of Nelson, you know, over the bridge and up the steep mountainside, you know, maybe 10 minutes into my drive, and all of a sudden I lost control of, well, not that car, but, you know, of the similar car. I lost control. I, I later was told, you know, they kind of did the forensic, you know, what happened, and the back wheel had, had blown out. But all I knew was that I just could not keep this car on the road. And, and just as terrifying, just as terrifying as losing control of the car was this reality that one side of the highway was straight down hundreds of meters to the Kootenai River, and the other side was steep mountainside. And my car was headed to the river side. And you know, it, it's funny because it all happened so fast, and you probably have these similar kinds of experiences in your life where it's happening so fast, and, and, and yet it's kind of in surreal slow motion. And it's like your life, as they say, is, is flashing before your eyes. And I'm thinking, I'm going over. My life is over. I am done at 19 years of age. And somehow, I was able, because the car was just all over the place, heading towards the drop-off, to jerk that steering wheel and head it straight into the mountainside. Well, when I came to, uh, I was hanging upside down in this little tin can, and I remember two things really distinctly. There was this red stuff on me. Notice that right away. And there was this song playing. This is a few years ago. It was actually a tape deck, but anyway, you remember what that is. And I still remember the title of the song. The song was titled, When the Time Comes. I kid you not when the time comes. And I thought, I guess my time has come. <laughs> well, I quickly checked and made sure that the red stuff uh, wasn't pouring out of me. Uh, but as I realized, it was probably transmission fluid. Remember, the car is upside down and it rolled, uh, dripping on me. And so I managed to get the seatbelt off and crawled out of the window onto the side of the road where I stood by this stupid car. 
And as I stood there, I had this one, this overwhelming thought. It just gripped me that God had spared my life for a reason. Now, God had only come onto my radar that summer, a month or so before. But I was just overwhelmed with this sense that God had spared my life. I thought I was a goner. I thought my life was over. I was only 19 years of age. As I said, you kind of see your life flash before your eyes as you picture yourself flying off into the wild blue yonder. But God had spared me. And what that overwhelming sense of gratitude that I felt that God had spared my life led me to was this sense that God had spared my life for a reason. That there was a reason that I was still alive. And that my best life would be living the life that God had for me. First time that thought had ever occurred in my life. But that the very best life would be the life that God had for me. And so as I stood by the side of the road, you know, with cars stopping to see this spectacle with sirens blaring, I surrendered my life to God. I said, God, this life is your life. My dreams, my plans, my future, all of it is yours. The reason that I share my experience with you this morning is that as we continue in this series, as, as we've called it pain management, as, as we grapple with this idea in our lives and, and personalize it and wrestle with it, that all pain, or sorry, all addiction is pain management, soft addiction, hard addiction, real addiction, culturally acceptable addiction, all addiction is pain management. There is this, this third step in the recovery process. And again, I, I've tried to be clear in my communication that, that there's something critical about these steps that I think can apply to all of us, no matter where we're at in life. But this third step, it, it goes like this. We made a decision. And certainly that word is very significant. We made a decision. It's like, here is a decision point to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. To turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Now this morning, you may read that, you may look at that, and you may say, what? Like, you want me to do what? Like, you have got to be kidding. Because the reality is, for all of us, we manage the pain in our lives the way we manage our pain, right? We have our defaults. We have our ways of going about dealing with this pain that is a part of all of our lives. And now these steps of recovery call us to do radical things, things that, that in many ways seem so counterintuitive. Starting with this idea that the way to actually gain power over an addiction, an unhealthy way of dealing with pain in your life, those things that you can't control, is to recognize you're powerless. And then, powerlessness, and, and then to, to put your trust in someone other than yourself. It's like, ah, like what is that? With, with the information, with the belief that there is this God, you know, as AA says, there is this higher power. We would personalize that and say that, that there is actually this God that you can turn your life over who cares for you. That, that actually is inclined, committed to even, giving you his power to overcome these things that we face in life. Let's just call them things that, that so often can feel like they're going to overwhelm us or defeat us. Now, as soon as I say that, I think for a lot of, a lot of us, there's, there's almost like this red flashing warning light on our dashboard of our lives. But it's probably best described around this word, trust. How do we trust? How do we turn over our lives that we have a default of trying to come up with solutions for, to fix. How do we turn over our lives? 
and believe that there's actually a God in heaven that cares so deeply about us that he wants to lend us power to overcome the challenges and the addictions and the unhealthy ways that we try to manage pain in our lives that take all kinds of different shapes. Well, I could ask you this morning, how do you trust? And what prevents you in your life from trusting him? What prevents you? What is a barrier in your life when it comes to trust? Because, friends, trust is so essential to overcoming the challenges that we face in life, to overcoming the pain that we experience in life. So what prevents you from trusting? Is it betrayal? Is it, is it pain? Is it mistrust? Is it shame? And the places that shame can take us in our lives? If trust is essential, what is it that becomes a barrier and prevents us from trusting? And we're going to talk about this in the weeks ahead. But there is this incredible researcher by the name of Renee Brown that has these amazing TED Talks and has written some incredible books. But she really looks into, she kind of puts the microscope on shame. And, and this is what she says about shame. And I, and I think it's, it's just so profound. She says if you put shame in a petri dish, so in other words, if you isolate, if you could isolate shame, it needs three things to grow exponentially. Now, I, I would just in, in maybe challenge you to think about the fact that these three things that she names are actually the three things that so often travel with shame. Three things to grow exponentially. And, and remember, exponential means multiplication. It's not just addition, it's multiplication. It is like throwing the gas on the fire so that it burns out of control. She says there are these three things where shame will grow exponentially. And, and what are they? Through secrecy, through silence. Through judgment. Now you just think about that for a moment. Now remember, there is this distinction between guilt and shame, right? Guilt is what we feel in our lives when we've done something and we went, oh, that was bad. You know, I shouldn't have done that. And we feel guilty about that action, about that thing that we did. It's kind of like it eats away at us and, and we feel guilt over it. But shame is very different Shame isn't something we feel about, something we've done. Shame is what we direct towards ourselves. We go beyond just that was a bad action to I'm a bad person. You think about this and how exponential the effect of shame, the influence of shame, the experience of shame is in our lives because our default, it seems, when it comes to shame, are these three very things of silence of secrecy, of judgment. Because we think, I don't want anybody to know. I already feel bad enough about myself, right? I don't, want, I don't want to tell anybody. I don't want anyone else finding out about whatever it is that I already feel about myself. I'm going to keep it a secret. I'm going to keep silent about it because if I tell somebody, if I trust somebody, this shame is just going to be worse. Or they're going to judge me harshly when they will give you what? You feel what about yourself? But you know, as bad as the judgment is that other people can bring towards us, or the fear that we have of that judgment, sometimes the worst judgment is the judgment we bring against ourselves. It's the criticalness we feel towards ourselves. For instance, I have this friend I was talking to this last week, and for decades, decades since I've known her, she has had these dark thoughts about herself. She tells herself, my dear friend, she tells herself certain things about herself. And when she tells herself certain things about herself, her shame and feelings of shame explode. That drag her down into this darkness of depression because there is no one else in her life, because she trusts herself with very few, 
the shame explodes and it starts to consume her with this, this darkness of depression. See, ad addiction, whether it's hard or soft, whether it's culturally acceptable or whether it's real addiction is, is AA and the recovery movement calls it those things that we identify, yeah, that's addiction, but also the culturally acceptable addictions that are, as we found out last week, nonetheless, so detrimental to us, so soul-killing, as Dr. Judith White puts it, that these addictions just amplify and accentuate the, the shame that we feel in our lives. And then we ask ourselves, how do I trust? If I need to trust, how? How do I possibly trust when this is already the pain that I feel in my life and the way that I think about myself. It'll be a disaster if I would actually talk to somebody else about this. But what I didn't um, continue with in Brene Brown's statement is this, and maybe you saw this, because I think this is so amazing and such an antidote to shame. Because as she said, if you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three ingredients to grow exponentially. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. But notice, if you put the same amount of shame, the, the equal amount of shame in the Petri dish, and douse it with, notice, empathy. It can't survive. The antidote to shame, the antidote to addiction, the antidote to unhealthy pain management is actually, in a sense, for most of us, the, the, the most counterintuitive thing in the world. It, it, it's empathy. It is experiencing the empathy of another. And this direction, this invitation of empathy, finds fulfillment. It, it, it can't help but make me think of this incredible, uh, unique, distinct, incomparable invitation that is made by Jesus. Uh, the invitation, I want to read it to you first of all from this, this paraphrase, and, and I think this invitation is, is, is unparalleled. But this is what Jesus says, and, and I invite you to just personalize it for yourself this morning. Are you tired? Parents this morning. Uh, are you tired? <laughs> Jack. Are you worn out? Jack, Jack. Are you burned out on religion? <laughs> and maybe some of you go, huh, what? Burned out on religion. Now, I find that one actually very interesting because when we came to Abbotsford, moved to Abbotsford, tried to understand Abbotsford, one of the things that we identify as the local predicament in Abbotsford is what we call religiosity. That there is this spirit of religiosity here that becomes this, this barrier, becomes this burden for people, to people actually experiencing the life that God has for them. And so Jesus identifies these things that, that probably all of us, to one level or another, go, check, check, check. He's speaking my language, Jesus. But notice what he says. Come to me. Get away with me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Yeah. And I just want to highlight that, that, that one phrase that I think is so significant for what we're talking about when it comes to, to pain management and overcoming addiction because you'll notice what Jesus says here. He says, um... I think we can go back. Oh, no, we're fine. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. Get away with me, and notice, you'll recover your life. What is Jesus offering us? Jesus is offering the ultimate recovery. Jesus is offering full recovery. Jesus is offering real recovery. And notice when Jesus asks the questions, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you, are you burned out? It's not a message of condemnation. 
It's not that Jesus answers those questions like we may perceive so many around us answering that question. Don't you dare admit, right? Don't you dare show people that you're sweating right now. Like, keep it together, okay? And instead, what is Jesus doing? He is acknowledging for us, this is real life. Like, this is the breaking point that life takes us to. This is how life chews us up and spits us out. And Jesus does not say, shame on you. How could you feel that way? Suck it up. What's the matter with you? What does he do? He acknowledges our pain. He acknowledges the difficulty of life. He extends empathy towards us. And he says, I understand. I understand what you're feeling. I understand what you're going through. But not only do I understand and extend empathy towards you, I open my arms wide and I invite you to experience me. And I invite you to experience a life again that could be described as the ultimate recovery. It's the life that deep down in our hearts we're actually searching for. The life that, that so many of our addictions and unhealthy pain managements take us away from. You know, when I think about uh, Jesus' words, um, literal words, again, this is a paraphrase that I love. Um, I, I'm reminded that there are some details that were so familiar in Jesus' day that if we just take a moment and explain them, I, I think they might be helpful. Because Jesus literally says this, and, and, and you may be familiar with these words. Yeah, just one more, please. Oh, okay, one more. <laughs> uh, there we go. Take my yoke upon you. Yoke, what? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You know, we may go, what in the world is that talking about? The image that Jesus was drawing on was such a common and familiar image in one day, and and really, he's emphasizing the, the positive nature of this image. Because on one level, when Jesus talks about a yoke, he is, he is picturing this. He is, he is envisioning this, if you look at this slide. And you put this, this yoke on two animals, and all of a sudden, again, you know, we talk about exponential. There is this exponential factor. You put the yoke on the two animals. It's not just simple math. It's not just addition. It's not one plus one equals two. You put the yoke on the animals, and there is this exponential nature of the power that these two animals bring to whatever they are doing over one animal. They pull together, and they bring more power. And they can sustain it for a longer period of time. And so there's this very positive image that, that Jesus portrays with this word yoke. But, but Jesus is actually communicating something that was also familiar in his day uh, that maybe wasn't so positive. And it's really a contrast with the invitation that he brings. Because a yoke was understood in Jesus' day as what a teacher or what a rabbi, this is a common practice in Jesus' day, a teacher or a rabbi offers you as a student. So if you were going to follow a teacher, if you were going to follow a rabbi in Jesus' day, well, what you would do is, is you would take on yourself this rabbi's yoke. His teaching was called a yoke, and you would carry, in a sense, his yoke. And, and I'm sort of generalizing, but the reality was that, that some of these rabbis maybe... Many of them, they had hundreds of rules and regulations. You take on their yoke and there were all these things that you had to remember, all these things that you had to do, all these things that you had to take on your life. And elsewhere, Jesus condemns this very harshly. Because these rabbis, when you took on their yoke, they didn't make life easier. They didn't make life easier lighter. They didn't enhance your experience of life. They put this burden upon you. They made life harsh and unmanageable. See, even though this, this term, yoke, is an archaic term, the truth is this. We all yoke our lives 
to something. We all yoke our lives to something. There is something in each one of our lives that we tie our life to. And in many respects, when we do this with the best of intentions, with the hope, with the belief that, that this thing is going to make my life better, this person even at times is going to make my life better. Sadly, too often, this is the path that leads to unhealthy pain management in our lives. This is, this is the path that, that can lead us to addiction. Because these things that we put our hope in, instead of delivering what we're longing for, they actually require more of us. They actually start to cost us. In fact, we even put our hope sometimes in people. And, and the reality of what Jesus is picturing for us here is that there is no person that can withstand be the recipient of all of our hope. And so often, our disappointment in life, so often the cost of, of what these things, of what these actions that, that we try to invest ourselves in require of us, they actually just lead us down the path of addiction. They require more from us. They place a burden on but do you see, as we think about Jesus' invitation, that what Jesus is offering us, that the life that he is inviting us into, is a radically different life. That what Jesus is saying is not this often communicated message that there is a God out there and he just wants stuff from us. It's just about what he can get out of us. The, the message and invitation to life that Jesus is communicating is the message of having a God that is for us. A God that, that wants great things for us. A God that invites us back into a place of, of actually recovering life. Not going into recovery, but actually recovering true life, real life. And can I just point out for you this morning, that what Jesus is inviting us into isn't a religion. That what Jesus is offering us here, it isn't a bunch of information so that when we have pain in our life, when life is difficult, we can go, hey, look at this verse, you know, and oh, you'll feel better. No, I, I, I'm not dissing that uh, because scripture represents the, the truth of who Jesus is. But it's not a religious system like, hey, there's this book and this historical information, and somehow this historical information is going to make your life better. What is Jesus offering and inviting us into? It is actually a relationship where Jesus is saying to us, hey, this is your experience of life. You're experiencing pain right now, pain in your marriage, pain in your friendship, pain in your work. Pain because there's something inside of you like this angst that you just cannot figure out what is going on inside of you and it's expressing itself in all kinds of, of destructive ways. Jesus says, in those moments, like all of the moments of life, my invitation to you is to experience me. It is to know in the midst of whatever life looks like for you, I'm there for you. I'm inviting you to experience the freedom of life the life that you were created for. A life where you experience my power and my strength to overcome unhealthy pain management and addictions and all the things that we yoke ourselves to that we can so easily feel such a deep sense of disappointment in. And oftentimes it's that disappointment that can lead us down those paths of addiction because we really feel better. We're looking to deal with our pain in ways that we can get a fix that frankly maybe in the moment give us that, but in the long term don't address the deep issues of our heart and our life. And so this morning, I want to invite you to take step three with me because you can notice it says this. We made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Again, this isn't just, hey, got some more information this Sunday. Woo <laughs> it's 
decision. It's a decision to turn over your addiction this morning to go, this is it. It's a decision to recognize, you know, the ways that I deal with pain in my life, they're not healthy ways. It's a decision to believe that there is a God in, in heaven who offers you an experience of life, a, a recovery in life, recovering your true life through the person of Jesus Christ. And just think, friends, take a moment with me again and look at how radical and distinct and unique this invitation from Jesus truly is because this is what he says to us. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you. I'll show you. It's not like figure it out on your own. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't play anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live life freely and lightly. And in response to Jesus' invitation, I'd like to give you a couple of action steps this morning. The first one is this. Can you identify what your life is yoked to? That language is a little, eh. Can you identify what you've committed yourself to? Uh, can you look at and identify what it is you're really hoping, putting your hope in for your life? And here's the real question behind that. How's that going for you? How's that going for you? And the second action step is this. I don't want you to walk away this morning and go, hey, we had this invitation from Jesus. Awesome, let's go into the week. I'd like to invite you to reflect on it. I'd like you to think about the fact that Jesus is making this invitation to you. He is saying to you these words. He is inviting you into this kind of life. And so this week, I'd encourage you to turn to the letter of Matthew. And it's in the Bible. And read. The end of chapter 11, that's where these words of Jesus come from. You can get the YouVersion app, and, and you can reference it all through the week. Or, perhaps easier, John is going to put this very invitation up on our social media at City Life. Would you turn to it? Would, would, you, would you reflect on it? Would you, would you think about this is an invitation that Jesus is making to you? Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. And experience this life. And so here's my final question. In response to Jesus' invitation, who are you going to trust? Who are you going to trust? Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you make this invitation to us. It's not religion and a whole bunch of requirements about doing this and doing that. It's you, the God of heaven, opening your arms up wide and inviting us into a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray this morning that wherever we're at, with the difficulty of life, with the pain of life, frankly, with the goodness of life, that we would turn our hearts towards you, that we could truly experience the recovery of life as you have meant it to be. I ask this in